You're listening to the Fresh Hell Podcast. Fresh Hell contains stories of a disturbing and often graphic nature and is intended for a mature audience. Please don't let your kids listen to this, or they might turn out like us. Hi, I'm Johanna in Austria, and you're listening to your favorite international podcast. The podcast that covers murder, mystery, and the macabre throughout history. You might have already guessed it, Annie is not here with us this week. She had a family situation coming up. Uh, she had a sudden death in the family. She will be here next week, but let's keep Annie and her family in our thoughts. Also, if I sound weird today, like the way I'm talking, I had some dental surgery last week and it might still be affecting my speech a little bit. One last thing before we get into today's episode. Just want to take a minute for a shout out to our newest Patreon members and they are Jean K. Niederberger and Sammy Sharp. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your support. We couldn't do it without you. And if you want to know more about all of that, please listen until the end of the episode. That's when I'll tell you all about it. All right, let's dive right in. This will be the third and final part of Lost in the Jungle. And if you didn't listen to the first two parts, please do that now before you listen to this episode, because otherwise you will miss a lot of information. And for everyone who already listened but needs a quick refresher, here we go. If you don't need the refresher because you waited until part three was out and you just listened to part one and two, just feel free to skip forwards like two minutes or something like that. The story begins with Yossi Ginsberg, a young Israeli backpacker born in 1959. Fascinated by adventure stories, particularly influenced by Henri Charrier's autobiography Papillon. Charrier, convicted of a crime he claimed he did not commit, became famous for his escape attempts from Devil's Island. Inspired by such tales, Yossi dreamed of exploring the places described in Papillon's book. After three years in the Israeli Navy, Yossi worked various adventurous jobs to save money for a South American journey. In 1981, at 22, he embarked on an expedition through Venezuela, Colombia and Peru. In Peru, in Puno, near Lake Titicaca, Yossi met Marcus Stamm, a Swiss backpacker. And Yossi decides to travel with him to La Paz, despite initially planning to visit Machu Picchu. In La Paz, Bolivia, they encountered Kevin Gale, a 29-year-old American photographer. Kevin, who had significant backpacking experience, was a close friend of Markus. Additionally, they met Karl Rupprechter, an Austrian geologist, who claimed to have explored the Amazon rainforest extensively. Karl proposed an expedition to find gold and uranium and promised to guide them to an undiscovered indigenous tribe. Excited by the prospect, Yossi persuaded Markus and Kevin to join. However, shortly before the journey, Karl informed them of a change in plans due to family obligations. Instead, he agreed to be their paid guide. The group commenced the expedition on 4th of November 1981, flying to Apollo and then navigating the challenging terrain along the Tuiki and Asariyamas River. They faced difficulties such as rain, food scarcity and challenging landscapes. Marcus, the more cautious member, clashed with the group over various decisions, leading to tension and frustration. Problems escalated when Marcus suffered foot issues, slowing down the group. All these problems led to the decision to return to Asariyamas for supplies, despite Yossi's desire to press on and meet the indigenous tribe. Upon returning to Asariyamas, the group decided to have the locals build a raft to float down the Asariyamas river to Rurenabake, from where they would take a plane back to La Paz. Marcus, however, was supposed to travel back to Apollo by mule, and the four wanted to meet back up in La Paz, where hopefully they would be good friends once more. As they prepared for the rafting trip, Marcus changed his mind and decided to join Carl, Yossi and Kevin. The journey proved challenging, with Carl's leadership causing frustration among the group members. They encountered difficulties navigating the raft through rapids, and the group dynamics worsened. Marcus, still dealing with foot problems, felt like a burden and Carl accused Yossi and Kevin of treating him like a servant. Eventually, Carl decided to end the expedition and expected the others to follow him to a nearby settlement. However, Kevin secretly planned to continue the rafting journey, believing they could navigate the dangerous San Pedro Canyon, 
Ultimately, the group did split up, with Marcus accompanying Carl and Yossi staying with Kevin. As Yossi and Kevin continued down the river, they faced challenges in navigating the raft through rapids and rocks. Then the worst thing happened. The raft got stuck on a rock, leading to a life-threatening situation. In an attempt to save Yossi, Kevin jumped onto the riverbank, leaving Yossi stranded on the raft. The last thing Kevin sees of his friend is when the raft is lodged and Yossi, still holding onto the raft for dear life, is pulled into the canyon. The two friends are now separated, alone in the Bolivian rainforest. Last week, we already told you that Kevin was rescued after five days, but Yossi was still out there. And this is where we left off last week, and today I will tell you about Yossi's fight for survival and about Marcus and Carl, who were on their way to the nearest settlement, and of course about the aftermath of this extraordinary story. Yossi was at the riverbank without any of the equipment, but he was sure that Kevin would be on his way to find him, and he was just going to stay where he was and Kevin would come. It might take him a couple of hours, maybe even a day, but he would surely find him. And hadn't Carl said that if something would happen, they should stay at the riverbank until help would arrive? And now it had started to rain and the sun had begun to go down, so Yossi knew that it would be best to find shelter for the night. He moved away from the river a bit into the jungle and spent his first night alone in the Amazonian rainforest, cuddled up against some rocks. He was still soaking wet, had no way of lighting a fire to dry his clothes and warm up. The climate in the Amazonas area is best described as tropical and humid. The temperature remains relatively high throughout the year. Daytime temperatures can range from 25 to 30 degrees Celsius, which would be 77 to 86 degrees Fahrenheit. And nighttime temperatures typically do not drop significantly. There is high humidity levels due to its lush vegetation and proximity to the Amazon basin. Humidity levels often exceed 80% contributing to the overall tropical environment. And, as the name suggests, the rainforest receives a substantial amount of rainfall, with the rainy season generally occurring from November to March, with the heaviest rainfall in December and January. So that's exactly the time when uh, Jose and his friends were in the rainforest. During this period, frequent and intense rain showers are common, but even though the climate in the Amazon areas is tropical and humid, and temperatures are rather high, Nights in wet clothes without a fire. I can't say I'm a fan of that. So Yossi spends the night and the next morning he decides that it was probably for the best to try and find Kuriplaya. Remember that was a mining settlement that was supposed to be abandoned this time of the year, but he could maybe find some equipment there. And it was supposed to be a four-day march from there to the next settlement, San Jose de Uchupiamonas. And Kuriplaya couldn't be far from where he was. Carl had told them that it was a day's march from the San Pedro Canyon. And Yossi was sure that he had passed through that and was already on the right side of the canyon. In this very unlucky situation, Yossi was extremely lucky because he found the pack with the essentials. Kevin's trick with the empty cans he had tied to the pack had proven to be extremely smart. It had indeed kept the pack afloat. Everything in it was a little bit damp, but that was okay. He now had a little bit of rice, beans, matches, uh, a flashlight, mosquito repellent, a poncho, the fishing equipment and a first aid kit. Yossi's second night was already a bit better than his first. He now had a poncho to cover himself, although he still couldn't make a fire because the matches were too damp and he had food and he had even found some fruits in the jungle. He must have been so hopeful to make it out of there alive. The next day, Yossi decided against his previous plan to walk towards Kuriplaya. He didn't want to leave Kevin behind. Kevin, who had nothing but a machete. So Yossi started to make his way back, going in the direction he thought Kevin must be. And I think that was kind of a mistake in my opinion. And I get it, you don't want to leave your friend behind. And even Carl had said that they should stay together no matter what. So I'm in no way judging. I would have probably done the same thing, but... I think it was a mistake. So Yossi walked for hours trying to find his way back to Kevin and it was exhausting. He hit dead ends, suddenly encountering drops that went down dozens of feet. His feet hurt, he had scratches and wounds and his clothes were still damp. But by the end of day three, he found a cave that he used as shelter and he was finally able to light a fire. And that meant he could at least cook some rice and beans. 
and he finally took his shoes and socks off for the first time in three days, and it was bad. His socks showed red and yellow stains, his skin was peeling off, everything was bloody and full of pus, his feet were severely infected, probably jungle rot, and he could feel that he was running a fever. But at least now with fire going, he could dry his feet, his socks and shoes. And remember what we told you in episode 1? Always keep your feet dry and warm people, that's the most important thing. So he stayed in the cave by the fire for a while, hoping Kevin would see the smoke and find him, but Kevin didn't come. Nobody came. And by day five, Yossi felt better again and knew it was time to move on. He decided that it was pointless to run through the jungle looking for Kevin. I agree. Who knew if he was even still alive? After all, Kevin could have fallen, a jaguar could have gotten him, or a snake could have bitten him. There were so many deadly things lurking in the rainforest. So Yossi decided that it was for the best to make his way to Curiplaya and either wait there for Kevin or find a way to San Jose all by himself. Of course, what Yossi didn't know was that by day five, Kevin was not only alive, but that he was about to be found and rescued by two indigenous men. Kevin had decided to float down the river on a tree stump and that's what led to his discovery. So the very next day, it must have been 6th of December, and the sixth day of his ordeal, Yossi started to walk in the direction he suspected Kuri Playa. But he made a severe mistake. He thought it would be best to climb up the ridge of the mountain where he would have a better view and from there follow the river downstream. He had the impression that it was one continuous ridge as far as he could see. So he climbed up there, which was an exhausting ordeal. And once he was up there in the windy heights, he couldn't see the river any longer. But he could see that he had been wrong. It was in fact not one continuous ridge, but several mountains, which meant he would have to climb up and down and up again and down and up again and so on and so on. Something that would be nearly impossible in his condition. And seriously, where was the river anyway? No matter where he turned, every direction just showed the same view. Dense vegetation, but no river. In which direction was he supposed to walk now? And he knew that the next day he had to climb back down again, back on the way he had just crawled up, But for now, he needed to find a place to rest as night was falling. And this would be the night Yossi encountered the jaguar. He had been worried for days now that a wild animal would attack him during the night. So he had prepared himself for such an occasion with what he had on hand. He figured that he could use the mosquito repellent spray can and the lighter to make a crude flamethrower in case he would ever find himself eye to eye with one of the big apex predators. And he put his spoon in one of the cans so he had something he could use to make some very loud noise by rattling. And that night, up on that ridge, he had troubles falling asleep. He hadn't been able to find anything like a cave or a niche to hide in, so he was lying under his mosquito net and poncho, without a fire going, very unprotected. And he could hear something moving. Close to him, getting closer, he heard twigs breaking and leaves being moved around. And when he tried to see what it was, he saw the jaguar. And this is how Yossi describes his encounter with the jaguar in his book Back from Tweaky. By the way, this book is available under different names. I think the latest edition was released under the name Jungle, because that's also the name of the movie based on this story. In the movie, Daniel Radcliffe plays Yossi Ginsberg. I can really recommend the movie as well as the book. The movie does take a little bit of liberties, but it's a good one. So, this is what Yossi had to say. Quote, It stood at a distance of about 12 feet, just stood there looking at me. It wasn't blinded by the light, but it stopped and looked me over. It didn't appear particularly menacing. It wasn't roaring or licking its chops. Its eyes were neither ferocious nor meek. They were just great cat's eyes staring at me. The jaguar stood perfectly still, only its tail waved slowly back and forth. Go away, I whined. Get out of here. Beat it. Do you hear me? Get away. I was trembling and started to scream loudly at the jaguar. Get out of here, you son of a bitch. Go away. I'll burn you up. Get away. The flashlight had a chain to hang it from. I clamped it between my teeth in order to have both hands free. I felt around on the ground by my knees and found a repellent spray and a lighter. I held the lighter in my left hand and the spray in my right hand. Now I was calm. I didn't scream or tremble. Maybe I shouldn't try it, I hesitated. 
It might just make him mad and then he might attack me. But then I pushed down on the spray button and lit the lighter. It worked. The spray caught fire and spewed an enormous blaze. I could smell the scorched hair on my left hand and I was completely blinded. I held it for a few minutes until the spray ran out and the flame of the lighter grew weaker. My makeshift flamethrower was exhausted. My sight returned gradually in concentric circles of fading darkness and finally I could see the beam of the flashlight. The jaguar was gone. I shined the light around in fear right and left in back of me. The jaguar had vanished. I thought I could hear receding footsteps. Had it worked? Had I scared it off? I felt neither joy nor relief. I kept the flashlight on for a while but was afraid of running it down and turned it off. I sat inside the mosquito net, wide awake, my heart jumping wildly at every sound until the merciful morning light. The sunlight gave me a tremendous sense of security, as if no danger could befall me. I packed up my gear while I murmured a hasty prayer of thanks and got out of there as fast as I could. Now that the sun was shining, I remembered exactly in which direction the river should be and walked on rapidly. End quote. So after a while, he had made his way back to the river, well, to a river, at least, and once more there was just no way to keep his feet dry anyway, so he decided to wade through the shallow parts of the river. His feet obviously didn't like that at all, and they started to trouble Yossi once more. Yossi figured that the river he was following now must be the Turliamos, and that river would merge with the Twiki, and then he would find Kuri Playa, the mining settlement. Unfortunately, one misguided step and Yossi fell into the now raging river, almost being swept down a waterfall with a 25-foot drop. And 25 feet means absolutely nothing for me, so obviously, as always, I had to uh, do the conversion, and it's six and a half meters. So yeah, you don't want to go down a six and a half meter waterfall. But thankfully, he didn't go down that waterfall. He almost drowned anyway, and he suffered several minor injuries, but managed to get back on dry land. And he didn't even lose the backpack. Once more, his clothes and shoes were soaking wet. Well, uh, his clothes were not only wet, they were also torn in several places. I think by then it must have been around day 10 for Yossi. And he must have been so miserable, wet, wounded, with jungle rot, severely malnourished by now, even though he still held on to most of the beans and rice. But he must also have been very miserable mentally. All his hope was on finding his way to Kuri Playa, where he was sure to find shelter, food and equipment, and maybe even other humans. And by nightfall, he had actually made it to the spot where the Turliamos flowed into the Twiki, and at last he knew exactly where he was now. And now all he had to do was follow the Twiki. And at first that was easy enough. There was a wide sandy riverbank that Yossi could walk on. But soon enough the shore became rocky once more and those rocks grew bigger and bigger until they formed a rift and it was almost impossible to walk on them any further. Yossi had to be extremely careful not to slip and fall or twist an ankle or break a bone. All of this would be very bad alone in the jungle. But he needed to stay close to the river because he was too scared of getting lost again before he could reach Kuri Playa. He says in his book, quote, A few more hours passed and I thought that I surely must have gone more than half a mile. Doubt began to gnaw at me. What if I didn't find Kuri Playa? How did I know that it even existed? Since it wasn't marked on the map, I had only Carl's word to go on. Maybe Carl had been mistaken. Or maybe he was lying. No, Carl would not have told an outright lie. I remembered how concerned he had been for us, but he was a strange guy and we had never seen the island and the little beachhead that were supposed to warn us that we were heading into the canyon. That could have cost us our lives. At first Carl had claimed that he had traveled the length of the river twice, and then he had contradicted himself when he said that he had never been down it. We hadn't been told about San Pedro Canyon until we were almost halfway there. No, Carl wasn't particularly reliable. I remembered something else that was weird. Carl kept changing the date that he was supposed to return to La Paz. Looking back, it all seemed a bit fishy. Still, I had seen the letter with my own eyes. I didn't know what to think. It was hard to figure Carl out. If Carl had misled us about Kuri Playa as well, if it didn't exist, what would I do then? I could go back to the Turliamos and wait there for a rescue party, which would surely arrive before long. 
before, I could try to go on straight to San Jose. I was convinced that this camp did exist, however. It was marked so clearly on the map. I was still trying to figure out what I should do when I noticed a fallen palm tree. It had been chopped down at an angle, undoubtedly by a machete. I cried out for joy. I had made it. There had been people here. End quote. Yossi had indeed made it to Kuri Playa, and Karl had told them the truth. Kuri Playa really existed. Yossi found four abandoned huts, so his hope of encountering somebody at the settlement had not been fulfilled, but he had shelter for the night and he would sleep on a somewhat real bed. Other than that, he found a tube of a mosquito repellent and a walking stick that could double as a spear. But that was pretty much it, but he could at least spend a night in a warm and dry hut without having to fear wild animals. And he knew that from Kuri Playa it was only a four-day march, and with some luck, there would even be a trail made by the miners who came every year. On day 12, after spending two nights at Kuri Playa, it was time for Yossi to move on. And while he had managed to indeed find a trail, it was pretty much overgrown in some parts and hard to follow. So at first he followed the Twiki and tried to look for machete marks wherever possible. On a sandy riverbank, Yossi found some big logs and he decided to leave a message for possible search and rescue teams. He formed a big Y, for Yossi obviously, an arrow pointing in the direction he was going to walk, and a 12, because it was day 12. At one point, Yossi decided to follow the trail, or what he thought was the trail, rather than follow the river, and he was lost once more. He had strayed too far from the river and had no idea where he was, but decided to keep following the trail, and really, thank God, soon enough he could hear the river again, the trail had led him back to the Twiki, and then he saw a footprint. It was fresh, which meant someone was close by, and maybe it was even Kevin. So Yossi pushed forward, but then it dawned on him. Everything around him looked so familiar. The footprint, his own. The trail had led him in circles and he was back where he had started hours earlier. Now as someone whose whole body is hurting, who is on the verge of starvation, because let's face it, how much can you feed yourself with the occasional fruits and eggs you find? Wasting so much energy to go in circles is definitely devastating. And Yossi once more decided to, from now on, stick to the river, and he continued to walk. He needed to find his way out of this jungle, and his best bet was to find San Jose. Over the next day, Yossi moved forward along the Twiki, but that doesn't mean he didn't encounter more problems. At one point, he disturbed a hornet's nest, which resulted in painful stings. I don't know, in summer we have bumblebees and bees and wasps and hornets in the garden and I always worry a lot about Jem and Leela, especially because of the wasps and hornets. Two summers ago I grabbed the garden hose and I didn't see the hornets sitting on it and obviously I grabbed it exactly there and of course I got stung right in my ring finger and I was honestly about to go to the hospital to get my wedding ring cut off because my finger swole so badly. Thank God, after a while the swelling went down a little bit, but I seriously couldn't get my ring off for over two months, which was crazy. But back to Yossi. Another time Yossi slipped and fell and basically, I don't know, there's no nice way to say it, he impaled his butthole with a branch, which sounds horrifying. Uh, it involved a lot of bleeding, obviously. He also found tracks of a whole pack of jaguars, which is super scary. Jaguars are solitary creatures, which means that if he saw several sets of paw prints, I assume it must have been a female with her offspring, which adds an extra layer of dangerous. Then he encountered wild boars. Thank God they didn't notice him. And if you listen to us regularly, you know that's my only fear when I walk the dogs, that I encounter wild boars. And just before Christmas, we were driving home late at night and not far from our village, we had five boars crossing the road right in front of us. Uh, there have been a lot of sightings lately, not only in the woods, but also in the field. So that's a very scary thought for me. It's been 14 days now that Yossi was alone, lost in the jungle. Two weeks. On some sandy riverbed, he made another sign out of driftwood, an arrow, pointing in a direction he was heading, a big Y, and 14. And now Yossi was sure that he was only a day's march from San Jose. And that's when the next disaster struck. Flooding. On the night of day 16, heavy rains and thunderstorms started, the Twiki started to swell, 
The water was rising and flowing into the cave Yossi had used as a shelter that night, and he barely managed to grab all his stuff and make it out of there, the water already reaching his chest by that point. Yossi, trying to reach a higher ground, was fighting for his life. I mean, he has been fighting for his life for the last two weeks, but this was another extremely dangerous and exhausting situation, and it took him quite a while to finally reach a hill where the water couldn't get him, and again, everything he owned was soaking wet, and with the heavy rains and the wet wood and the leaves, there was no chance to light a fire and dry himself. So Yossi kept walking further and further away from the river to get away from the flood. He was ankle deep in mud. He lost every sense of direction and was desperately looking for a place to rest. But again, Yossi made it through the night and he lived to see the sun go up the next day, which was day 17. He was in a bad shape. It was not only excruciating hunger he felt, his feet were infected and had a rash all over. His inner thighs were rubbed raw from walking in wet clothes. He had cuts and bruises and scratches and bug bites all over. And that's when he started to lose hope. The hope that he would reach San Jose? Gone. The hope that someone would rescue him? Gone. Even the hope to find more fruits and eggs? Gone. All washed away by last night's storm. But what did Yossi do? Well, he allowed himself some minutes of self-pity and utter hopelessness. And then he got himself together and he just kept going. That's what we always tell you. And he did find the strength to move his body forward. He even managed to find some more fruits along the way. While he was trying to find his way back to the river, he heard a plane. But with him not being at the river banks, but covered by the dense jungle foliage, the plane didn't notice him no matter how much he yelled and waved his skinny arms. But Yossi had hoped that this plane meant that they were actually looking for him, that Kevin had made it, or that Marcus and Carl had arrived in La Paz and realized the two were missing, and they had alerted authorities. And he trusted that they would be back the next day, so he had to get himself down to the river, onto a wide sandy part of the river bank where they could spot him. And then Yossi encountered something that many of us fear since childhood, because of movies and TV shows we watch in the 80s. Quicksand. He took one wrong step and found himself up to his waist in a bog. Now, if you listen to our episode about quicksand, you know how hard it is to free yourself and how most people don't die from drowning in quicksand, but from exposure and from loss of blood circulation. And now we have this severely weakened man stuck in quicksand. And at first, he's in absolute panic mode, wiggling around, trying to reach some branches or leaves to pull himself out. But as we told you in that episode back then, the panicking is the absolute worst you can do because it will only make you sink more and more and fast. And that's what Yossi realized and he tried to calm down and he leaned forward as much as he could and slowly, slowly started to wiggle himself free and he fought for what felt like at least an hour. But he did it. He managed to get out of the bog and onto solid ground. But the next horror was already waiting. When Yossi finally found a place to rest for the night, he got attacked by huge termites who bit him everywhere. His ears, eyelids, his raw feet. They were merciless and it took a lot of strength for him to get up and fight the insects off. Uh, fun fact, I read somewhere that ants and termites can be attracted by the smell of urine. If I remember correctly, it has something to do with glucose level in the urine when your kidneys are having problems. I'm just mentioning this because Yossi writes in his book that before the termite attack he had peed himself and this was probably what attracted the termites during the night he thinks. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, Yossi had made his way back to the Twiki and at once he realized that he was back at Kuri Playa once more. All these days of walking, all these days of agony, and he was back again at Kuri Playa. But the huts were all gone but one, and that one was half destroyed. The flood must have taken everything. And there, back at the abandoned mining settlement, Yossi did something he hadn't done for several days now. Something he had been dreading, and it took him all his strength to do it now, but it had to be done. He had to take his wet socks off. He describes it in his book, quote, First, I removed my shoes, which in itself was agony. Then, little by little, slowly, painfully, 
I peeled the sock from one foot. It was incredibly painful, torture of a degree that I had never before experienced. The sight of what had been inside was more horrible still. Red, raw flesh. There wasn't a shred of skin left on my foot, and that wasn't the worst of it. My toes were plastered together in a stinking pulp of blood, pus, and mud. My bare foot was so sensitive that the slightest breeze passing over it was like a thousand tiny needles stabbing into my festering flesh. It was a good thing that I hadn't removed my socks on the way. If I had seen what condition my feet were in, I probably never would have had the fortitude to go on. I rested for a short while and then clenched my teeth and took the other sock off. That foot was just as bad. I threw both socks into the tin of water to clean the pus and mud from them. I bunched the second net into a wad and rested the heels of my feet on it. I couldn't cover my feet with the net, even its light touch was unbearable. Fortunately, it had grown dark and the mosquitoes had ceased pestering me. End quote. It was now the 20th of December, the 20th day of Yossi's ordeal, and with that thought Yossi fell asleep. He was awoken by something that sounded like a bee, but it grew louder and louder, getting closer, and now he could hear people. It was a boat, with people on it, and one of them, Kevin, and they had found him. After almost three weeks, he was finally saved. Because what Yossi didn't know, but what he had obviously hoped all those weeks, was that Kevin had survived, that he had made his way out of the jungle, and that he was now looking for Yossi. Well, we already told you last week how Kevin had been saved after five days, and how he had been brought to San Jose. And once he had recovered, he had made his way to Ruranapake, and from there to La Paz, where he tried to get authorities looking for his friend Yossi. But it was hard, almost impossible to get them to search for Yossi. They were sure he was dead by now, as it had been more than 10 days since they had been separated. Nobody wanted to help, not the US Embassy, not the Israeli Embassy, not the local authorities. Finally, 17 days after they had been separated, the Israeli Embassy managed to organize a search plane that was about to fly over the Twiki looking for Yossi, which must have been the plane Yossi had heard a few days back. One flight over the river, that was it. Everybody was absolutely certain that Yossi was dead. There was just no way that an inexperienced person would be able to survive in the jungle for more than two weeks. I don't know, they must have all forgotten about Juliane Köpke then, because uh, the 17-year-old had survived, what was it, 14 days in the jungle in the 70s? Thank God Kevin didn't give up. He was looking for someone who would take him on the Twiki by boat someone who was willing to help him find his friend. And he found someone, a local man named Tico, who they called King of the River. He was willing to take him up to the Tuiki Bascuri Playa and almost to the San Pedro Canyon. And that's what they did. They kept going upstream, looking for signs of Yossi, but found nothing, because obviously the flood had taken all the signs he had put out. And they were about to turn their boat around when Yossi woke up by the noise of the motor, and he came stumbling out of his shelter, and that's how he was rescued. Now you might want to know what happened to Marcus and Carl. Well, while Kevin was in La Paz trying to form a search party for Yossi, he realized that Marcus and Carl had never arrived in La Paz. So he went to the Swiss embassy to report Marcus Stamm missing, and then to the Austrian embassy to inform them that Karl Ruprechter was missing as well. And that's where he heard some extremely worrying information. And this is how Kevin told Yossi the encounter with the Austrian ambassador and how Yossi retold it in his book. Quote, the mention of the name Karl Ruprechter caught their attention. The clerk asked me to wait and then showed me into the consul's office. He was a heavyset, red-faced man smoking a pipe. Have a seat, my young friend, he said. Tell me what you know about Karl Ruprechter. I told him briefly about Karl, what he had told us about himself, and how he had talked us into going along with him on an expedition into the jungle. I told him how he had changed plans because of his uncle named Josef Ruprechter, who owns a big cattle ranch in Reyes province, that his uncle was a Nazi war criminal, and that was the reason he lived in Bolivia. Interesting, very interesting, the consul kept repeating. I told him about the Indian village that we had been supposed to visit, how it had turned out to be further away than we had thought, 
so we had to turn around and go back, and I told him how we had rafted down the river, how we had split up from Carl and Markus, and about the accident that you and I had had on the river. I told him that I had come to report Carl's disappearance and perhaps to organize a rescue party if no one heard anything from him within the next day or two. I was amazed when the consul laughed. That's a good one. Help you look for Karl Ruprechter, he said. We'd much rather help him get lost. And he laughed some more. An uncle who raises beef cattle? A fugitive Nazi? Karl has such a vivid imagination. He noticed a stunned look on my face and this was what he told me. Karl Ruprechter is quite well known to us, but he doesn't have an uncle in Bolivia. Karl himself is the escaped fugitive. He is wanted by both the Austrian government and Interpol. He's a professional troublemaker, an instigator. He was involved with radical leftist groups in Europe about 10 years ago. He and his friends stirred up a lot of trouble and the Austrian police were looking for him. He was either lucky or well-connected enough to make his way here. Someone must have provided him with a false passport. We know that he is here, but there's nothing we can do about it in Bolivia. Now you've brought me some really good news. He's out there in a dangerous jungle without proper food or equipment. Would be nice if he never came back. We certainly aren't going to help look for him, the consul told me with a good chuckle. There is no Indian village, civilized or otherwise, in that entire region. I learned that Carl had the reputation of being a dangerous bastard. A few years ago, he talked a young German guy into going into the jungle with him, promising him exciting adventures. The German became sick and weak after a few days and pleaded with Carl to take him back. But Carl refused and just abandoned him. The poor guy managed to make it to a little ranch where they saved his life. End quote. So Karl Ruprechter was not really a geologist. He had never seen an indigenous tribe. He was bad news. And he and Markus would never be seen again. To this day, the two men have never been found. Nobody knows what happened to them. Most think that they got lost in the jungle and died. But I also have to add, there have been rumors of people saying they saw Karl Ruprechter in one South American location or another, and after knowing that he simply abandoned a German tourist before, it's not hard to believe that he would abandon Markus Stamm somewhere and make his way out of the jungle alone, and then just vanish under a new name. And it's so sad. I read an interview with Markus Stamm's brother from 2018, and in that interview he said, that their mother, who was well over 90 in 2018, she still had hope that Marcus will come home one day. There's also another theory, and I just want to make very clear that I don't believe that one, but it's been getting discussed now and then, and uh, that's why I want to tell you about it. And this theory says that Ruprechter never existed, that he was made up by your St. Kevin, because... Basically, some think that it was just the three of them out there in the jungle and that Marcus died one way or another. And maybe that even Kevin and Yossi ate Marcus to survive and that they made up another person, Karl Ruprechter, to blame Marcus' disappearance on him. I think people who believe this think it's too unlikely that Kevin would be able to find Yossi last minute after almost three weeks. They think that all of this, the rescue thing, the finding and rescue thing, was all part of the cover-up that Kevin knew exactly where to look for Yossi and that it was all planned out. And I can see why some would think that, but I honestly don't think that's true. Also, there exist two photos of Karl Ruprechter that Kevin took, I think. I mean, of course, it would be easy to just use any photo of a man and call him Karl Ruprechter and say that's him. Also, unfortunately, all the films from the expedition were with Marcus and therefore they're gone forever. So I don't know, I would have loved to hear any thoughts on this, why, if Karl Ruprechter existed, which I think he did, why did he approach Yussi, why did he talk them into this expedition, why did he change his stories all the time, why did he act as if he had more experience than he had, I mean, I wouldn't say he had no experience, he was good in some things, was this all a plan to get them into the jungle to rob them, which I find kind of unlikely? I don't know. I really I really would love to hear all your opinions on this story. Now, I want to end this tale of survival with info about what became of Kevin Gale and Yossi Ginsberg. Yossi Ginsberg emerged from the Amazon rainforest not only as a survivor, but as a compelling motivational speaker and author. We already told you about his books. 
They are testaments to resilience, leadership and the triumph of the human spirit over adversity. And beyond the written word, Josi Ginsburg transitioned into a renowned public speaker, captivating audiences with his inspirational talks on survival and overcoming challenges. His engagements at various events and organizations have been instrumental in motivating and inspiring individuals to confront difficulties head-on by drawing strength from his extraordinary story. In a very parallel trajectory, Kevin Gale found his voice as a public speaker as well. Gale too shared his perspective on the Bolivian jungle survival saga. Uh, he wrote a book. His talks too centered around uh, themes of resilience, determination, and the power of the human spirit when faced with this kind of adversity. I think he also became a very successful photographer, nature photographer, travel photographer. On the ecological front, Jossi Ginsburg's commitment extended beyond the storytelling, because he's very passionate about the rainforest conservation. He was involved in establishing the Chalalan Eco Lodge in the Madidi National Park of Bolivia, This ecotourism initiative aimed to promote conservation, sustainable development and responsible tourism practices. Chalalan Ecolodge stands as a beacon for preserving the biodiversity of the Amazon region while actively involving local communities in ecotourism initiatives. I looked at the website and I know I said in the last two episodes that I would never set a foot in the rainforest. And any kind of disagree with me, she would do it on a, on a, like, um, organized tour kind of thing. And looking at the photos of the Chalalan Eco Lodge, it looks beautiful. It looks beautiful. It almost could get me to want to go to there. <laughs> and that's it. I really would love to hear uh, your opinions about Karl Rupprechter and what was the deal with him. Something good. Well, my something good is that last week, Tuesday, I had some, semi-extensive dental surgery. As I said, that's why maybe some of my my pronunciations are more off than usual. And the good thing is that everything is healing wonderfully. There's no complications so far, knocking on wood. That was a very important thing that needed to be done since before COVID. And then with all the travel restrictions and, and the lockdowns, I just, you know, pushed it further back and back and back. But now finally, I did it and it was horrifying, uh, just with local anesthesia and I'm such a scaredy cat when it comes to dentists. But yeah, it was very important and everything looks good. And that's it. Please go check if you can leave us a rating and or review. Um, many people now join from finding us on Spotify and Amazon Music and Audible, which is fantastic. Welcome. Thank you for listening. If you could leave a rating and a review on those apps, that would be great as well. Please go check out our webpage. There you find links to our Facebook group. That is the most wonderful group of people to our merch store, to our PO box, to our email address, to our what else? To our Patreon. We just had Patreon get together, uh, on Tuesday and it was lovely. It was just uh, Annie and me and one of the Patreon Hellions and we had a lovely discussion about Natalia Grace. Starting from February we will do some changes when it comes to get together. We will try to record these things so that people who don't have time to make it to the get together can then watch it later on. Please tell your pets we said hi. Hug them, love them, cuddle them, take them to the vet and be kind to them. Be kind to your fellow human being. And most important of all, please be kind to yourself. That's hard, but you need to do it. And remember, as Annie always says, quoting Winston Churchill, if you're going through hell, keep going. Tschüss.